Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. Shall we seek the Lord's guidance as we open his word this Sabbath day? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing us day by day. We thank you for this blessing of your word and for the opportunity we have of opening your word with like-minded brothers and sisters. Guide us as we open your word. Direct us so that that which we address and the manner in which we address it may be according to that which we should do on the Sabbath. Help us to truly enter into the rest that you would have us enter into. May we draw closer to you on this day. We remember Father Elder Pippinger and his family. We ask Father for your blessing upon them. There are many others, Father, with unspoken prayer requests. You know their hearts. You know their needs. Please be with us and please be with them. Direct us now. Help us so that our minds may be focused upon that which you would have us to understand. For this, we thank you. And for this, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to do a little review here in the book of Zephyr. Now, Zephaniah is considered a minor prophet, but I think as we, as we go through this, we're going to find that there's quite a bit for Zephaniah to show us. Now, we established using Zephaniah 1.1 that Zephaniah gave his warnings in the days of Josiah, the king of Judah. Now, was he considered the last good king of Judah? Or was he like many of the others that he was considered as an evil king? No, he was a good king. Okay. Yet here in the days of Josiah, the message comes, I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. And again, as we look at this with the marginal readings, by taking away, I will make an end from off the face of the land, saith the Lord. So, God is going to end the situation. Judah is receiving the message that you have not adhered to my covenant. And because you have not adhered to my covenant, your destruction is going to occur. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the idols with the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. Is this a total removal? Is this a total destruction? How do we see this? And more importantly, how do we apply this to our situation today? Well, if I'm not mistaken, they didn't utterly wipe out uh, everything, man, beast, and alike, when uh, Jerusalem was shut down the two times. So would this be, from the wording, wouldn't this be the end? 
<clears throat> well, if this is the case, is and, and the question is asking, is this more applied to the end when we know that all man, all beast, everything is is wiped out for the thousand years? Well, it's definitely typical, right? So we know the destruction of Jerusalem is a type of the end of the world, both in 586 and in 70 AD. But this situation with Josiah, this warning is being given even before 677, isn't it? Uh, no, it's after 677, but before 607. Um, or is this, you're saying this is before 677? No. Well, I'm, I'm saying, I mean, the time of Josiah was before the time of Manasseh, wasn't it? No, oh, no, he's the grandson of Manasseh. Josiah is the grandson of Manasseh? Yeah. So you got Manasseh, uh, Ammon, Josiah, then you have uh, Jehoiakim. Um, well, before Jehoiakim, you have Jehoahaz, then Jehoiakim, then Jehoiachin, then Zedekiah. Yeah, so Manasseh's, Manasseh's earlier than Je Josiah. Okay. Yeah, so this is this is in the time dur during the period between the captivity of Manasseh and the captivity of Daniel. This is that a period of reform that uh, Zephaniah is writing in, right? So he's writing um, in the days of Josiah and the the son of Ammon, right? And Ammon's the son of Manasseh. Okay. So we have this period of reform. Mm -hmm. We have a time period in which God has noted Judah and its kings have walked against me. This is going to occur. So here we have the consumption of man and beast, consumption of the fowls, and the fish of the sea. So I think, as you're saying, this would be more typical to that, to the end of the, of the world, but it's a message that is given for us before, should we say, before the Sunday law? Yeah, well, well, the destruction of Jerusalem is a type of the Sunday law, because the end of the world, the Sunday law is, is part of that history. So it's about the Sunday law. It's about the end of the world, right? Because we can we can zoom into or zoom out from any way mark or reform law. So that's what the word here. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Let's say in the word stumbling blocks uh see it in the feminine in the Hebrew. Stumbling blocks. That's interesting. Okay, so how do you look that up? Uh, I saw it on eSword. eSword. Okay. So I double check it and see if yeah. Um, yeah, so the word which which we also have as idols. Um So, yeah, it's um, it's a noun, and uh, it's a feminine plural form. Okay, so as a feminine plural, <clears throat> with this warning being written to Judah, with the church and the movement as being typified by Judah. We are looking here that these stumbling blocks are the idols that need to be removed from our own lives. Mm -hmm. So we're being given a choice. Is this 
<clears throat> is this warning another type of the third angel's message? What would you think? Is it not a life or death message? Yes, definitely. Okay, so if it's life or death, is it not another type of the third angel's message? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now Zephaniah continued. I will also stretch out my hand upon Judah and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from the place and the name of the Kimarans with the priests. So is this warning foreshadowing the warning that Ezekiel gave in Ezekiel 9? I mean, yes, it, it is. Okay, because we begin, we, we see these men with the slaughtering weapons beginning at the house of the Lord, and then they go through the rest of Jerusalem and then into Judah, right? So <clears throat> here we have the warning before the warning. Yeah, well, what you have with um, these four seven times, so you have Manasseh's captivity, um, in a period of 70 years. And in that period, there's this reform of Josiah, and we have Zephaniah prophesying in that period. And then we have um, the, the failure of that reform. Then we have Daniel's captivity. Then we have Jehoiachin's captivity. And finally, it ends with Zedekiah's captivity and the destruction of the city and the temple. And each of the prophets writing that, that period are referencing the symbols from Leviticus 26 because they recognize the time that they're in. So you're going to have Ezekiel who's addressing the fourth, the fourth seven times because he's already had the captivity of Jehoiachin. And so he's looking at the tying up of all of this destruction. But each of these prophets are going to be addressing these same things. Okay, so if Ezekiel is, is typifying this the fourth seven times, <clears throat> is this portion of Zephaniah showing us portions of the second? <coughs> right. <seven times? laughs> Well, all of them, but I mean, it's leading up to the second seven times because the failure of this reform will lead to the captivity of Daniel. Okay. Right. So, but they're still all connected. I mean, he's still looking in a sense to the end as well, to the destruction of Jerusalem, because that's what the seven times for literal Israel is going to be addressing. The, the actual Babylonian captivity, the actual destruction of, of the city and the temple. But these become types for us at the end of the world. Okay. Zephaniah 1.5. And them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and that swear by the Lord, and that swear by Malcolm. And I believe that Malcolm could also be as Molech, correct? Or have I missed? Have I misunderstood that? Um, yeah, yeah, Molech. Okay. <clears throat> the alternate reading has this, that and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and that swear to the Lord, and that swear by Molech.
why would why would a people swear to the Lord and also swear by Molech? Well, uh, as we looked at the Hebrew there, it means against the Lord. Right. So that word too means against. So so in a sense they're they're following Molech, but they're swearing against Jehovah. That is, they they've put their so they're not swearing by the name of the Lord, right? They're not <clears throat> following God. They're actually following Molech, and they're swearing against the Lord. So they're in opposition to him. So they're cursing him, really. Okay, so when a people were following Molech, what were they doing? Well, they're rejecting Jehovah. They're rejecting God. Literally, how did the people worship Molech? Wasn't that the, the fellow that they threw their children into the arms that uh, of a red hot uh, statue? Yes. W weren't they giving him their children. I mean, they were sacrificing their children. That's what one of the characteristics of Molech. Okay. So <clears throat> my question then, if we're going to have a application for today of this verse, how would this be occurring within the church and how would this be occurring within the movement? The accept them of abortion. Uh, I think I'm that's not, one way I mean, of looking at it. Yeah, I would say it's more education. And that's yes, true. I agree. Here we are. We have many parents that seek to send their children to Adventist colleges. Children that then go on to seek degrees to build <clears throat> labyrinths, prayer labyrinths, and decide that spiritual formation is a good thing because their teachers are telling them so. Is this any different than sending children to the public colleges for the indoctrination in socialist propaganda. Well, this is worse. Yeah, it's something worse. Yeah. So we have we have some that have their children go to the liberal colleges for a quote liberal education. We have others that go for a supposed conservative education. One is turning to the left and one is turning to the right. Are we to do either one? No, we're supposed to continue on straight, not turning to the left or turning to the right. Now, it is this verse from our conversation this last week that we use to segue into first kings 15 and and there was the the fact that i saw it as 1133 correct so so that kind of uh saw the significance there first kings so, 1133 as as we were looking at this we were comparing joshua 23 7 and first kings 1133 yeah. so the joshua portion that ye come not among these nations, that these remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourself unto them. <clears throat> and then 1 Kings 11.33, because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Kamosh, the God of the Moabites and Molech, the God of the children of Ammon and have not walked in my ways 
to do that which is right in mine eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgments as did David his father. So bear with me one more moment and then we're going to go into 1 Kings. And them that are turned back from the Lord and those that have not sought the Lord no, nor inquired for him. This verse is fairly clear. Are we not to return to the old paths? Are we not to seek the Lord with our full heart? Are we not to ask of him that which he would have us to do. Most definitely. <clears throat> so now, <clears throat> let's go to First Kings. So, as we get, begin this portion of 1 Kings 11, we have Solomon turning from God. The King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zidonians, and the Hittites. The daughter of Pharaoh was an idolatress. We've already just been warned that we are not to follow after the gods of the Moabites, of the Ammonites, and the Zidonians. Yet here we have five nations, five different nations, plus the daughter of Pharaoh, every one of them an idolater. So Solomon, who sought and received counsel from the Lord twice, chooses to turn away. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. <clears throat> Was this true love? Let us consider further. <clears throat> and he had 700 wives. How can you have true love with 700? How can you have true love with 700 wives and 300 concubines? <laughs> I mean, come on. You don't even have time to pay attention, let alone pay attention to the other 699. Right. At this point. I, I would say it was lust more than love. Thank you. My point exactly. <clears throat> If God had wanted man to have multiple wives, Eve and more would have been created. Yet in the Garden of Eden, he showed us it was to be one man and one woman. So here is Solomon, 700 wives, 300 concubines, that's a thousand women. My mind just does not handle well the idea 
of one man with a thousand women. Yet here we have multiples. What is that? Broadcasting is seed? Well, whatever it is, it wasn't good. <laughs> Basically, by the time we reduce the total of the thousand to its lowest common denominator, we, we come close to the number 10. And I believe as we've studied in the past, the number 10 is the number of judgment. So was a judgment brought upon Solomon? Now, as we continue through this, when it says that King Solomon loved many strange women, the alternate readings brought us back to Deuteronomy 17, 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart not turn away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. But we're also being shown from Ecclesiasticus. Thou didst bow thy loins unto women and by thy body thou wast brought into subjection. When someone is brought into subjection, are they not brought into slavery? Mm -hmm. Bondage, yep. Now the portion from Deuteronomy 17.17, 17, the doubling, is a warning, I believe, to those that would be selected as king over the children of Israel. God foresaw that these children, his people, would reject his rule. And he gave a warning to the kings not to act like those around them. First Kings 11, 4. For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. That's a question. We know that Solomon came to the throne at what age? Not sure, but wasn't it 30? I thought it was like 18 or something. But I believe that Solomon came to the throne at 18. Yeah. Because David was, I believe, about 70 when he died. So I want you to consider for a minute, brothers and sisters, if Solomon was 18 when he came to the throne and he reigned for 40 years, how old would he have been when he died? 58. Or wait, yeah, 58. Yeah. Today, would we not consider him still to be a relatively young man? Mm -hmm. Yes, and they say that he was old. Yeah. <laughs> lifestyle wore him down. Oh, I, I would say his lifestyle really wore him down. Yeah. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites. And this verse, repeating this from 11.7, says, Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, 
in the hill that is before Jerusalem. And for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Now, when it's saying here in the hill that is before Jerusalem, what hill might this be? Well, it could be the Mount of Olives. I mean, it's possible. That's what I was thinking. Because that, that lies towards the east of Zion. To me, it's interesting that if, if this was the Mount of Olives, that Solomon would have built an altar at the Mount of Olives on which to worship. And by the time of Christ, he was able to worship in the Mount of Olives where there were no literal altars for idols around him. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully <clears throat> after the Lord, as did David, his father. Here we're given a comparison between Solomon and Caleb. Can somebody read the Numbers 1424 that's on the screen? But my servant Caleb because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land where into he went and his seed shall possess it. So Solomon is being compared with Caleb. We are able to see that Caleb followed the Lord completely <clears throat> And Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, turned away from God. What does that say for us today? What kind of a warning can we take from this? So my mind goes immediately over to um, that he might uh, fool even the very, uh, if the very elect, if possible. Okay. And so, I mean, you know, <laughs> Solomon, I just still can't get how they call him the wisest guy in the world. Okay. <laughs> now, see, when, when I'm thinking of this, verse comes to mind. Trust not in your own understanding, but acknowledge him. Yes. So Solomon trusted in his own understanding. He trusted that he knew better than God. Well, he did get his wisdom from God initially, but then he began to trust in his own wisdom. Right. This shows us at this time that we are not to walk by sight. Are we not told that we are to walk by faith? And not by sight? Yes. Yep. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and the hill before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all of his strange wives which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. Here we have a situation. Solomon was raised 
to understand that there was one true God. Solomon's outreach was not unlike that of the world. Solomon chose to accept and allow his wives, or as we wish, we, we may wish to see it, these other churches to continue to practice as they so chose, rather than showing them the path and the way of the true God. What kind of an outreach do we have when we, as the church, choose to accept that which is not in God's order, rather than accepting what God has presented before us? How can we accept other methods of biblical interpretation when we already have? Miller's rules. If we are taking these other methods of biblical interpretation, are we not turning back upon God? Are we not turning away from God? We are leaning on our own understanding. Exactly. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Second angel's message. Okay. So if the Lord had appeared unto him twice, then Solomon was given the portions of fear God and give glory to him. But if he, did not, if he did not listen to that second message, would he be benefited by the third? Negative. Certainly not. Okay. Now, we're given that his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel. We come back here to... 1 Kings 11, 2, and 3, which we've just read. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you. For surely they turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon gave, these, gave unto these in love. And then we go through the detail of the 700 wives and the 300 concubines. Now, it's referenced that the Lord appeared twice to, to Solomon. 1 Kings 3.5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what, it shall, what I shall give thee. Why is it important that we note that Solomon was given this vision in Gibeon. What tribe controlled Gibeon? Uh, Benjamin. Thank you. I believe we've addressed Gibeon in the past, and we're going to address Gibeon further in the future. Now, the next verse, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, as he had appeared unto him at Gibeon. So, again, the reference is given from 1 Kings 9, verse 2, that the Lord appeared a second time unto Solomon. I'm sorry, uh, just a real quick comment. Uh, sure. You know, I was doing this study on the, on Judges 21 yes. or Joshua 21. Yes. 
and uh, one of the questions that I pop, that popped into my mind uh, was um, they call Gibbon or Gibeah. That's that's all the same, right? Gibeon and Gibeah. That, that's the same place, isn't it? I believe that's correct. Okay. Um, I, I think I might have overlooked or we might have overlooked something um, as we were approaching on the minor. I think it was the minor, we're doing a study on the minor prophets, wasn't it? Which okay. like we're doing it today. I, I can't remember when it was, we were supposed to give this stuff up by Thursday. And so is that for today? Is that what that was? No, that what, what, what we did, the reason, the reason we didn't do this on Thursday is there were some questions that had come up one of the one of the questions that was being asked was <clears throat> who was responsible for joshua 15 oh okay <clears throat> we didn't there, there was no one that stood up to say that they had taken joshua 15 mm. now i was led to send a an email to theodore wednesday afternoon and suggest that we go back over some of the light that had been addressed during this last week, mm -hmm. especially with the different lines and the different charts that Stephen and others had been presenting. And what I was led to recommend was for us to begin the study of these portions of Joshua on Sunday. So we would take it this entire this next week to deal with Joshua and to be able to go through these books to see exactly the things that you're referring to, some that I've been led to, and some of the things that, that have been seen in some of these other chapters. Yeah, because I think we're, we're missing a few things. Uh, just with that little short study of the 21 that I was doing, I, I started, there was questions that started coming up to my mind because of the way we were talking about that that one Levi there, there, I think there's things that we're missing and we, it, it's very uh, reasonable to want to, you know, review that stuff. I, I, I heartily applaud exactly what you just said, brother, because you're right. There is a lot that we missed going through this from the book of judges Yet there is much that we will be able to bring out as we get into that chapter that, that you're assigned, that you're taking. And there's, there's several things that when, when I looked at some of this, as I was being led into looking at it, that I was, I was absolutely blown away with. And I fully agree with what you're saying. So I'm going to be really interested to see what, what you have seen from this. I think I sent the, uh, the document to uh, Theodore so you could see what my first thoughts were. Because I, okay. I, I pulled that stuff up on the, like the first day that I, I did it. Okay, I'll be interested. Theodore, if you could forward that to him. Earth to Theodore, are you here? Sorry, yeah, I, was, I think he's doing I it. Sent, I sent it to everyone. Okay. Um, okay. So, 1 Kings 11, verse 10. And had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. So now let's go into 1 Kings 11, 11. One third of 1133, but we have a doubling. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is with thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. <coughs> So God 
has shown Solomon the blessings that he would give him. Here we come to 1 Kings 11.11. 11, and the kingdom is going to be torn from him. Is he not being shown blessings and curses? Yep. Is, is this not showing him in active detail the seven times within his own life? Yeah, I think so. This, when, when I read through this, it's like, how can anyone, any logical student of scripture, say that the blessings and the curses of Leviticus 25 and 26 don't apply when we're seeing it enacted within Solomon's life and as we go through the lives of many of the other kings. How many times do we have to be given this warning before we wake up to it? Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Solomon is being told, I won't do this to you, but it's going to happen with your son. Howbeit, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David, my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. Prophecy fulfilled. There's going to be even more to this. So, how many tribes were there? Twelve. Um, Eleven, though, because one of those tribes was dispersed between uh, the other eleven. And what tribe was that? Well, Levi. They had cities in all the tribes. Okay, but if, if we go through the, the count of the tribes, do we not see 12 where Levi is not being mentioned? You know, I actually never actually looked at that. So here's my, here's my point and my question. If I, was to, if I was to look at the way that the division of the land was done, we would see that there was Judah, Simeon, Reuben, Gad, Benjamin, Ephraim, Dan, Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulun, Naphtali, and Asher. That's 11, right? Well, let's count them again. Judah, one. Simeon, two. Reuben, three. Benjamin, four. Gad, five. Ephraim, six. Dan, seven. Manasseh, eight. Issachar, 9, Zebulun, 10, Naphtali, 11, Asher, 12. They didn't mention Levi at all. Yeah, because Levi, Levi's not numbered among the tribes. So Joseph gets the double portion. Levi doesn't get to be counted as one of the tribes. <laughs> yeah. Um, because they can't use the number 13. No, that's not, <laughs> that's not the reason. Okay, so 
I, let's focus on this verse. Now, that Theodore has a very good reason for focusing on 1133. I'm going to focus right now on 1113 because I like your consideration on a point here. Theodore, I mean, I've, I've got a I've got a chart in front of me showing the division of the promised land of the 12 tribes. Do you have anything like that that you have on your computer? Yep. Okay. Well, I have, I have the one here in uh, my, yeah. So I have the, it, whose is it? Rand McNally, uh, Palestine among the tribes. Okay. So, we, yeah, yeah you, right. don't, you don't have Levi as one of the divisions. They just right. get cities. Okay, I'm going to pause my share for the moment. Can you please put this, put your uh, screen up here? Yeah. Okay, now, this is, this is a little difficult for me to see, but I think we can we, stop. Come back up. Okay. So you want to go back this way? I want to go back down. Okay. I want you to see something here. Now, the way that this is being shown with this portion with Rand McNally. Yeah, I'm going to make it a bit bigger. Yep. Okay. It shows Judah. But as I'm looking this, as I'm looking at this particular map, there's a tribe that's missing. Simeon. Thank you. Well, Simeon's at the bottom, below Judah. Mm -hmm. So I got Simeon down there. Okay. I got now Simeon, Judah. So J Simeon gets the southern part. And then Judah. Okay, give me a second. My map shows that Simeon is within Judah. Yeah, some people, yeah, that's later. So this is the actual divisions originally given. Later on, Simeon, Simeon becomes absorbed by the tribe of Judah. But this is the divisions given uh, in the scriptures there. Okay, so just a moment. So this is not what they end up with. This is what was allotted them originally. I don't remember exactly where I read it. I think it was in Joshua 20. Um, but the original thing, Judah actually uh, shared their land with somebody. And I think it was Simeon. Um, because Judah was too big at the time. I, I can't remember exactly where I seen it, but it, it was just before, I think just before the uh, verse or the uh, chapter that I was doing the study on Joshua 20. I thought that was kind of interesting. Okay. That, that could explain why later that it was reabsorbed. That, I don't think that's the explanation given in the scriptures, but. Okay. What I'm, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna share what I was looking at. Okay. I copied that back over, so hang. Okay, so. Do this. This. Let's see if this there it is good okay so come back to here yeah so i think you're referring to joshua 19 verse 1 
And the second lot came forth to Simeon, even for the tribe of the children of Simeon, according to their families and their inheritance, was within the inheritance of the children of Judah. Yeah, that was it. That, yeah, yeah, that was it. I, I read somewhat back because I kind of wanted researched what I was getting ready to <laughs> research on 21. Okay. Here's what I was looking at. Now, is this up on your screens? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So when, when I was looking at this to prepare for, yeah. for the studies, I'm seeing it this way because here is Simeon, Judah, Reuben, Benjamin, Gad, and all the others, right? Mm -hmm. Now, with this, the way that this map is laid out, and the way that Brother Ron was talking about this, Simeon would be within Judah. Mm -hmm. Right? Because yeah. it says that the, the land, uh, what it says here is, um, uh, well, basically, the land allotted to them at Gilgal was larger than they required. So that's Joshua 19, verse 9. Under the portion of the children of Judah, was the inheritance of the children of Simeon for the part of the children of Judah was too much for them. Therefore, the children of Simeon had their inheritance within the inheritance of them. Now, this word uh, within uh, means between. So, uh, I mean, there's not really, I guess, in drawing out these maps, there it's not really well defined exactly what territory Simeon has. It, it, but it gave me the, the wording gave me the impression it was inside of Judah. Similar to this map that, that we're talking about right now. That's kind of what I was in my mind. That's the impression I got. Okay. Yeah, I know. I, I understand that. But I'm just saying that's not necessarily, this is uh, just drawing a rough sketch. And yeah, I don't right. think that's what it was like. We know right. that K down at the bottom is going to be part of Judah. Um, so there is uh, this word within is more like uh, half between a dissection um, or a bisection, right? Can mean center, through, among, with. So there's lots of different meanings. It generally means to sever or to cut in half. So, so they're going to get a portion of Judah's portion. Is, that was the impression I got. Yeah, yeah, which is correct. And, um, but it doesn't really define their borders. It defines Judah's borders, but it doesn't define a Simeon's borders. I, no, I think the borders will, will be able to better define by the uh, cities and the description, the landmass description, because I've noticed that, like in the sides of Ephraim, um, where the Levites, uh, were they were like on the hillside and one of the words that they uh, shishim which is actually defined as ridge mm -hmm. um yeah but this but with with some of them they define the borders right with simeon they don't right right so with judah they define the borders and these borders are going to go all the way down to egypt uh, to the river of Egypt, all this different territory. And then with Simeon, they just define the cities that they get, that is their portion. Right. And that's, again, why I said that, you know, it would be better that we know or try to define the names of the cities and what they mean. And because like I was saying before, that's why I was starting to say, you know, we missed a lot. But we haven't done that yet. Yeah, this is true. Right, so, so that's what we're going to do. So we didn't miss it. We we're, we're just haven't done it yet. Haven't gotten there yet, yeah. Yeah, that's a different study. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Always impatient. I'm sorry. Okay. One of the flaws. Okay, so using this map, we are showing Simeon within the borders of Judah. We know that Simeon and Judah were sons of Leah, right? Right, yeah, I believe so. So 
if we were if we were to go through this specifically as as we are looking at this at these verses But I will give one tribe to my son, David, my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. We have these sons of Leah, Simeon and Judah. What was the position of Simeon in the pecking order of the sons of Israel? What was his birth order? Okay. This is guess number two. Yes. What was the birth order of Judah? Number five. I disagree with you. Okay. Uh, of, well, I have here a list. Reuben, Simeon, Levi. Oh, four I meant. Yeah, I, I was counting wrong. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, he's number four because he's the fourth of Leah. Okay, so I'm I'm going to go back to this for a second. We know from eleven eleven of First Kings, one tribe would be for my servant David's sake. That means that 10 tribes would be separated. We know that Christ comes as the lion of the tribe of Judah. But here we have the second son and the fourth son combined. Mm -hmm. Two for one. Is it possible that in this situation, in this example, in this literal map that is before you, that we are being shown the second and the fourth angel's message being literally presented within this tribal area? Can you, can you help me see this a little better? Okay. When we look at, at the other angel, the Revelation 18 angel, is this not a repeat of the second angel's message for us to give glory to God? I, I'm sorry, your question again, please. Okay. Is the message of the other angel, the Revelation 18 angel, a repeat of the second angel's message? Uh, I, Revelation 18. That's the fourth angel, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's also called the other angel. Yes, the yeah. fourth angel. Uh, yeah, right? Isn't that what it is? It's a repeat? So why I've always taken it. That's what I've taken it as I have been in this movement. So my question is the combination of Simeon within the borders of Judah playing out the second angel's message to give glory to God within the borders of Judah. So we have the second and the fourth again being combined to complete all of the angels' messages. I've never really thought of it in that nature, but you, um, it's possible. I mean, <laughs> there's no reason why he would give us these maps 
descriptions, right? Right. I mean, uh, in there and for no reason. There's no reason why he would he would just not give it to, I mean, give us that. There's something about it, obviously. But are we stretching things? Maybe not. <laughs> That's a very interesting concept. Well, let's let's look at this again. The first angel's message is fear God. We are to honor God for God is our father, right? Yes. Did Reuben honor his earthly father? Oh, no. No. Here we have Simeon. Simeon as the one that was the, the impetus behind selling Joseph did not give glory to God. He was taking glory upon himself. Judah. Was he not the one that feared for Joseph's life and looked to remove him from the pit? I think it was him. So Judah in action would have been fearing a death message because he did not wish to see his brother die. But in this situation, here we have the second and the fourth sons in a manner of speaking, playing out the second and the fourth angels' messages. Yeah, I can see this now. It's a little clearer. I mean, you're putting in, in the, using those symbolic terms. I Yes, i beginning to agree. Okay. When, when this was, when I was going through this, I was being led through this, in preparation i'm sitting here going this this cannot be happenstance this cannot be by chance so all of these things have been presented for our consideration all of these things are being presented for us at this time. We can look into the other tribes too. Yes. You know, in some other way too, like that. Like that. So there's going to be a lot that Brother Ron is going to bring out with this from Joshua 21, especially with the, the different points that are made in that particular chapter. Every one of these chapters has something to tell us about not only the time in which we're living, but about the three angels message and the message of the angel of Revelation 18. Now, okay. So it intrigued me as to the fact that as this was saying, I will give one tribe to thy son for David, my servant's sake. 
I'd always looked at it as well as being one tribe with Levi on this, you know, as a separate idea, but the Levi was already given only to God. So when we're talking one tribe here, we have to look at this in a different manner because we have 12 tribes that are listed. Eleven fourteen, and the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. So here is a relationship. Here is a cousin of the children of Israel. Here is one of Esau's progeny. For it came to pass when David was in Edom, and Joab, the captain of the host, was gone up to bury the slain, after he had smitten every male in Edom. For six months did Joab remain there with all Israel, until he had cut off every male in Edom. That Hadad fled, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him to go into Egypt, Hadad being yet a little child. And they arose out of Midian and came to Paran, and they took men with them out of Paran, and they came to Egypt unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and which gave him an house and appointed him victuals and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him to wife, the sister of his own wife, the sister of Tophanes, the queen. And the sister of Tophanes bare him Ganubath, his son, whom Tophanes weaned in Pharaoh's house. And Ganubath was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. And when Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers, and that Joab, the captain of the host, was dead, Hadad said unto Pharaoh, Send me away, that I may go unto my own country. Then Pharaoh said unto him, But what hast thou lacked with me, that, behold, that thou seekest to go to thine own country? And he answered, Nothing. <coughs> Albeit, let me go in any wise. Hadad of Edom. Is it possible that this was the one remnant of Edom that brought us to the king that did the slaughter of the innocents? Is it possible that this one remaining Edomite was responsible for Herod? And God stirred him up another adversary, Rezon, the king of Eladad, which fled from his lord Hadadezer king of Zobah. And he gathered men unto him and became captain over a band when David slew them of Zobah. And they went to Damascus and dwelt therein and reigned in Damascus. And he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon, beside the mischief that Hadad did. And he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephrathite of Zeradah, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zerah, a widow woman, even he lifted up his hand against the king. How many do we have here that are now opposing Solomon? Are 
are we not seeing a confederacy of three? Yeah, they're going to give the this three. These are the people that are his enemies, the enemies of Solomon. Threefold union. Threefold union. Exactly. So, is this not giving us another example of what we face in our time? It appears this, that way, yes. Okay. And this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Millo and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father, or closed the breaches of the city of David, his father. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man that he did work, he made him ruler over all the burden of the house of Joseph. What was the burden of the house of Joseph? Was Joseph not given a double portion and a double blessing within Israel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would have to have been the two sons, right? That's the question. What are we, what are we seeing here? And I know that we're moving quickly here because there's a point to be made in 1133. And we only have a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And I have to leave in a few minutes. I know. And it came to pass that at the time when Jeroboam was out of Jerusalem, that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him in the way, and he clad himself with a new garment. And they too were alone in the field. And well, I, don't, Ahijah, I don't think we can cover this in a few minutes because there's too much here. Okay. Um, so we're going to have to come back to this. Uh, I agree. The background here. So there's a ton of background here. Yeah. A lot of meat there. Yeah. So this will help us in our in our other studies as we go through it. But the main point here that we saw is that this has to do with the division of of Israel in with the death of solomon so um so there's lots here symbolically and uh literally that we have to understand in in order to to kind of move uh move ahead in some of some of the other studies as well it will help us quite a bit okay so we will leave off here and we will likely return to it this next week and recover part of it. But we would, I'm going to be interested to hear what, what Theodore is seeing in 1133 and the points that we can bring out from this. Mm -hmm. So for this, this coming week, let us each take a little bit of time to go back through this chapter and let's each try to bring a couple of different items for the study this next week that we are seeing that we, we've never really considered. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about uh, 11, right? First Kings yes. 11? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, oh, I, while I got you here, one sure. question. Um, I think I asked last week about the invite for the WhatsApp, that's uh, uh, called the Unity. Is that which one you- Yeah, you were sent the invite. Yeah, I, I've already got, I've actually been on that for a while and didn't notice. I kind of got away from the WhatsApp because of all the stuff that was going on with these other things. I didn't like getting bothered by all the stuff. <laughs> and I just neglected the WhatsApp and didn't realize that you were and the others were there. I've been spending a lot of time going over what you've been <laughs> writing about very interesting stuff thank you very much for that hey brother theodore yeah can you send me an invite to that um call to unity okay well we'll have to do this after i have to go okay. in right away 
I'd have to show you something quick and uh, okay. So we got to close this prayer. Okay, so you want to close now? Yep. Okay. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We thank you for the many examples that you've given us in these chapters that we have reviewed and that we have been reading. We ask, Father, for your guidance now. Be with those that will be traveling. Be with the meetings that will occur. Help us each one that we may understand that which you are presenting. May our minds be ready to receive, to process, and to understand. We thank you for this Sabbath, for this day of rest, and for this day in which we are able to come together. For this, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.